I want to help the field of education realize its potential to help realize all Americans' potential. This is Liliana Garces. She holds a JD and a PhD, and she was co-counsel in presenting amicus briefs to the Supreme Court of the United States in several landmark cases. Professor Garces explained to me how the courts have thought about the relation between racial and gender inequities, which is discrimination or unequal conditions, and college admissions, and how the court's conceptions shaped the admissions policies over the past few decades. Universities have to show a compelling interest in the educational benefits of diversity, and, the courts have ruled, they must not use affirmative action to redress past or current discrimination. How does this work out in the real world? Dr. Garces is associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin and affiliate faculty at the University of Texas Law School. Her research is grounded in the intersection of law and educational policy with a focus on access, diversity, and equity in higher education and the use and influence of social science research in the law. Willkommen, bienvenue, welcome. No, this is not cabaret, it's Think About It, a podcast about the power of ideas and how language can change the world, with Uli Baer. I'm really excited. I've been looking forward to this conversation for a while. I'm speaking with Professor Liliana Garces at the University of Texas at Austin, who's a legal scholar, a scholar of education, and who holds both law degrees and doctoral degrees in education. So Liliana, first of all, thank you for making time to for being on the podcast. Thank you so much for the invitation and the opportunity to engage in this conversation with you. It's great because I'd seen your name, of course, and the first time I saw your name is recently, actually, in the, the amicus brief, the amicus curiae that you submitted along with other of your colleagues, one of whom I've had on the show, on the Harvard case about affirmative action. And can you break this down for me a bit? What motivated you to submit this to a court? What is an amicus brief? Since you also study how courts use social science to make decisions in these cases that get the public very invested in the outcomes. Mm -hmm. Well, as, as you said, the courts can have very large influence in what happens in educational policies and practice, uh, particularly in the area of race conscious admissions. And a lot of my work is really trying to understand how those legal developments shape the work of institutions in this area. And also, I'm invested in having those legal developments be informed by what the research shows and the evidence that comes to bear on those legal questions. Broadly speaking, my work really examines the ways in which the law and then the education come together to shape access, opportunity, or even exacerbate inequities in society and particularly for historically marginalized populations in higher education. And as I said, you hold a law degree and a doctoral degree in education, and you've been on several sides of this. You've represented plaintiffs, and you've been an active lawyer, and you're also a scholar and researcher. Yes. And that training, that past training in law, really informs the kinds of questions that I ask as a researcher. And as a researcher, I try to bring those past experiences, which inform the questions that I ask, to generate knowledge and, and new research, empirical findings that relate to those questions. But that also, you know, I put on this hat of serving as a kind of translator of that body of evidence to legal audiences. So I'm able to use both languages, the language of being a trained social science researcher to understand those studies, to conduct the studies myself and generate questions that I think are important for those legal developments, but also to translate, you know, put on my hat of having been trained in law to understand that language and to translate then the language of social science that would be more applicable to a legal audience. 
Right. So you're in an unusual position. Can you say when you decided in the beginning, you got your law degree before you That's got correct. To yes. I practiced law for about five years before going back to uh, obtaining my training as a researcher, social scientist and education. And it was really my personal journey that culminated in this practice of law and my career in law that informed and motivated me to then be interested in education. I came to the United States at a fairly early age, about 11 or so. I had very humble beginnings, came with my mom as an immigrant. We actually made the journey without documents. I didn't speak any English at the time. Really? And really? I'm actually astounded. And then you got a law degree, an education degree. I can't hear that. So where did you, where did you come from originally? From Colombia. I grew up family? in a very rural area in Colombia and South America, a country that had a lot of violence at the time. And in that search for more educational opportunities, my mom, a single mom at the time, made the very courageous decision to immigrate to the United States. And we undertook a dangerous journey. And less than 20 years later, I found myself advocating before the U.S. Supreme Court, highest court in the nation, on behalf of other immigrants to protect the constitutional rights of those immigrants. So on this path, this journey, to give me one more step in between the 20 years. So as an 11-year-old girl, you arrive, and then you went to a regular American high school. You obviously mastered English pretty quickly. And then you decided to enter the profession of the law with what in mind? What was your sense? What could the law do? Because that's going to be our conversation. What can the law affect as a real change for Correct. people in the world? Well, I was always motivated by wanting to work on behalf of those who could not advocate for themselves in the service of really kind of a democratic interest for society. That was always something that motivated me. I give credit to my mom for instilling that passion for social justice in the work that I do. And then in that journey was, you know, I ended up in private schools. I started in a, in a Catholic middle school that led to a lot of help and, and lucky breaks. I had a lot of lucky breaks throughout that educational experience that gave me the opportunity to be able to pursue those high aspirations that I had. Can you say what are lucky yeah. breaks? For a, for a child or a student in different states coming from a background that isn't very privileged, doesn't yeah. have access. What's a lucky break? Because that's yeah. what these cases are ultimately about. Do people have a fair shot at the success Absolutely. that we all want and deserve? So it starts with ending up in Greenwich, Connecticut, a very wealthy place where my mother ended up having the opportunity to clean houses. And we happen to know someone whose daughter went to Greenwich Catholic Middle School. And the nuns there took an interest in helping us. They provided tutors to help me learn English. They, once they learned that we were moving to um, all the way across the country to the Pacific Northwest, they asked my mom to see if they could send some applications for high schools there. And it turns out my aunt just sends the one application, the one school that she happens to live close to. And it turns out to be this very prestigious school where Bill Gates went to high school. They helped me navigate the process for applying for financial aid and to really understand the process that I wouldn't otherwise have had access to. And through that, I then learned from my peers how to navigate, how to think about college, what you need to do to apply and become competitive applicant. I have prep uh, for the PSATs, you know, all these things that just were an unknown to me. Uh, to be able to engage in that journey. So it's the kind of journey that represents the very best that our education system has to offer, right? To help disrupt inequities, to help individuals realize their aspirations. But we also know that that's not the case for a lot of students who don't have these kinds of lucky breaks. Yes, there was a lot of hard work involved, but without those important individuals in that journey and probably admissions officers at the college where I ended, looking at my application and looking at my experience, my background, assessing that in light of my test scores, I'm 
probably was a beneficiary of so-called affirmative action. I think about it as a race conscious policy because as we'll get into, I think there's been developments that make it no longer this kind of robust affirmative action that was really the foundation of the policy. But you're describing the process. So there are people who guided you and showed you how to access the system that's there. And what you're saying is system may be there, but unless people are actually taught how to use it, how to take advantage of it, how to seize opportunities, it's not simple that anybody can just enter it. So you're saying there are steps of, along the way that people have helped you and actually spoken on your behalf than when you were exactly. still a student and got you. Exactly. It's really interesting. And then that informed your idea after college to become a lawyer and say, I can maybe help others and speak on their behalf, which is, I always think that's one of the great ideas of American jurisprudence, that everybody has the same voice before the court, presumably, that it shouldn't be influenced by your power, your status, who you are, but you should be able to speak to make your uh, case Yes, and not everybody right? has access to those resources, which is why it's so important that we have uh, foundations and in different organizations that are there to help represent the interests of those who don't, wouldn't otherwise be able to engage in that advocacy for themselves. And, you know, still also a lot of inequity within that system. In that process, I found myself in that career really culminating in this experience of practicing and having a case before the U.S. Supreme Court. And reflecting on that experience, it just it made me, and also very passionate about education, I wanted to shift and, and work within the field of education to help education realize its potential to provide opportunity and help individuals realize their aspirations as opposed to exacerbate inequities, which is the way in which we know education also functions. Right. You are a lawyer. You've argued before the Supreme Court. You have to tell me what the case was. This is such a highlight in many lawyers, and we have tens of thousands of hundreds of the lawyers in the country who would say, this is the high point of my career, and I'm going to even do more yes. law. So what was the case? So I should clarify, I was co-counsel. I did get to sit in counsel's table. I did not argue myself, but I was second there at counsel's table. The case was called the Moore v. Kim. The lead lawyer who argued before the court at the time, Chief Justice Rehnquist, was sitting at the court, Judy Rabinovitz. We were lawyers for the Immigrant Rights Project of the ACLU, and it was a case that had to do with the constitutional rights of lawful permanent residents who were in deportation proceedings, and we were trying to argue for an interpretation of the provision in a way that allowed them to be released if they could show that they were not a flight risk or a threat to the community while those deportation proceedings were taking place. Okay, so you were really advocating on behalf of vulnerable people who were in some kind of legal, legally uncertain status. Correct, they were yes, yeah. Un Correct, yes, Interesting, yeah. so giving them a voice. So then, and then you decided to go into education, as you said, to, to actually amplify the experience you'd gone through to say this could be good this can actually allow people to realize their potential and make a greater society education could be a correct, force for good correct. that was really for me at the heart of continuing my work of social justice but within a field that i thought was really fundamental to get there you've written quite a lot about the use of research and of studies and of data in the court decisions. So when you say social justice, you mean backed up by evidence, by studies, by scholarship. And the amicus brief that you recently filed, I think it's 531 social scientists and scholars. That's a lot of people. You had to summarize basically the viewpoints and ideas and findings of these people Correct. before the yes. court. Yes, and it has not just been me. They've involved a, a team of people and collaboration and understanding of the perspectives that need to come to bear for that. And fundamentally, it's really informed by the interest in having these legal developments that have such a important impact in the way that education policies play out, to have those developments informed by our social realities and not have it be this theoretical exercise of the ways in which the law develops, but really grounded in the way that empirical research shows 
race matters, for example, in our society. And that's quite interesting that you basically, you file an amicus brief with the court, which is unsolicited, right? The court doesn't ask anybody to do this. They, they will ask certain groups or individuals or foundations to submit information, right? When they do their fact-finding process correct, during yes. the case. Is that correct? That they do reach correct, out to yes. people? And then other groups can say, we'd like to submit something to the court for your consideration because correct. we think it's valuable. Yeah. Correct. Right. And then you wrote in one of your pieces, you said, the court may not look at it this. It may not. Right? They don't need to. The way that the litigation happens, so you have the main parties in the case, and they certainly submit briefs. And then you have these other individuals and organizations that would demonstrate they have an interest in the outcome of the case. And they want to inform the court on these issues. But the court does not need to read them. Or the clerks, really, the clerks for the justices don't need to. But it becomes important, really, as a movement for social scientists to try to have the law informed by this, because these efforts are really efforts to influence and shape educational policy and practice through the legal arena. That's an important strategy that requires, I think, the work of social scientists to come in. Right. And the two areas that I've been in conversation with a lot of your colleagues and experts, both legal experts, education experts, um, philosophers, is affirmative action and free speech, where legal principles that can become quite abstract sort of clash with the reality of the life's experiences of students, faculty, administrators. So there's something here that we have these legal conversations and then how it, it's played out on the ground in university. It's very Correct, yes. And all questions that are grounded in the consideration of race in educational policies, right? Because when you have that, then it triggers this review under the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution and how that clause gets interpreted, what it means, right? We have words on, in the Constitution, but it doesn't mean that it necessarily can give itself life, right? It's how it's interpreted by justices. And that's really where the fight over this has been. It's, it, re, it represents a fight over how will we interpret what equal protection means. Do we obtain equity through treatment that's the same, or do we need to treat differently in order to attain equity? That's really important. That was a really concise way of putting it. Can we slow this down a bit? To achieve equity, do we treat everybody the same? If some people would take that argument and say, yeah, and therefore we should eliminate considerations of race, also gender, and everybody is looked at the same, and then they have to come up with some metrics, I guess, test scores or something like that, that would be the same for everybody, right? That's the idea of sameness. There's, there's yeah. no difference. Well, ways. I would say that even looking at metrics of test scores, that's not necessarily looking the same, but that's uh, we can get into that a little bit later. You did work as a research assistant for life when you at some point, yes. right? Um, Who's written this really important book on the SAT. Correct, on the, the tyranny of the, of the meritocracy. <laughs> And I had great privilege to work with her on that book at the time that she was doing research for it. There's a huge body of research that show that test scores are not neutral. They're not neutral measures of achievement, but they predict or they indicate Correct. all sorts of other so things. So putting that aside for now, this idea of treating the same kind of grounded in the idea that in order for race no longer to matter, we can just stop classifications on the basis of race and that that's what's going to get us there, right? That, I guess, a perspective reflected by uh, Chief Justice John Roberts in one of the legal decisions that he wrote in 2007, which was actually my first case in which I was involved in an amicus brief there as counsel of record, where he writes that the way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to stop classifications on the basis of race a kind of anti-classification approach uh, way to understand the Equal Protection Clause. Then you have a, the other perspective, which is really where I fall, that in order to really address racial inequities, we need to 
tackle those inequities. We need to consider them and and be mindful of them and explicitly address it. And that's the way that we're going to get to more racial equity. Let me stay with it, this point. So does Chief Justice Roberts, would he assume there are no racial inequities to just drop race as a consideration? What do you say? Well, there is no different. There is no inequity. It's not so made explicit, but that is an underlying assumption that we can only think of treating the same as avoiding discrimination if we ignore the fact that you have existing inequities in place. If we account for those existing inequities and bring that into the picture, then we can't say that treating people the same is what's going to address discrimination. We need to consider those inequities and that that's what's going to get us to a more equal place. And then your approach is to consider the inequities. So you, in this particular case, you use race as a category that is a permissible, one of several categories. And can you explain a bit how that can be done, that people get worried and say, well, when you use race, how can you use it? Isn't it unfair then for some people, et cetera? This is what the Harvard lawsuit is presumably about. Just to break that down, what it would mean to use this as a category to address these existing inequities. And existing inequities, I wonder if there's another way of phrasing it, because it's still a very abstract term. I feel like I need to step back a little bit. We had the policy of affirmative action, for example, which started back in the 60s with an executive order that Lyndon B. Johnson issued asking federal contractors, which included public universities, to take affirmative action to promote the full realization of equal opportunity for women and for people of color. A policy that had the very, you know, comes from an intent of leveling the playing field and acknowledging inequities that are the consequence of a history of racial oppression and slavery in our society. And that is not really what we have in place. That's the way that considering race was really what started in the context of affirmative action. But then we had legal developments that have really restricted what that policy can look like. And that takes us back to that 1978 case at Regents of University of California versus Baki. Uh, the Baki case where you had Alan Baki, a white applicant to medical school. He'd been denied admission twice, had been denied admission to all the 12 medical schools that he applied to. He brings a challenge saying that The policy that UC Davis Medical School has in place, which was a policy that reserved 16 spaces out of 100 for historically disadvantaged students, that that policy was a violation of the Equal Protection Clause. Um, So he uses the Equal Protection Clause much earlier, 14th Amendment, to say as a white man, correct, not being treated essentially, fairly. yes, it comes down to the interpretation of that. And at the time, the court hadn't established what kind of test it would apply. Would it be a test that is based on this anti-classification approach, right? The understanding that it's those classifications that are harmful, that equate that classification with racial discrimination, and therefore we're going to require a very strict test for universities to have to pass for it to be constitutional? Or is it going to be this other perspective, what in legal terms is called the anti-subordination perspective, that would only apply that very strict test to classifications that are intended to oppress particular groups of people? Say Jim Crow laws, for example. So if it was a policy that was intended to oppress, that's when rather than help, which is really what was at play with UC David Medical School, that's the test that would apply. And what ends up happening is with Justice Powell's deciding vote, that anti-classification is what ends up winning. And then we have a test, a very strict test called strict scrutiny that gets applied when you have these considerations, and it creates this legal shift in how the policy can be used, a shift that then also translates in the practice that institutions can use. And then how can, especially universities now, public universities, how can they still use what was affirmative action in their, let's say, in their admissions policy? Yes, so with that shift, What they can do is they need to show that they have this compelling interest. And what the court says at that time is, 
the compelling interest needs to be the educational benefits of diversity. It cannot be addressing racial discrimination. And so you have this real big shift in the goal of the policy where it no longer is about addressing the ongoing consequences of past discrimination as well as current discrimination. It's about this future benefits of educational diversity and diversity very broadly defined. And so it shifts for institutions what that end goal can be. And it also shifts the process that they use to achieve that end goal. So the system that was in place at UC Davis with setting aside 16 spaces out of 100 was deemed to be this quota system. And Justice Powell says you cannot use that kind of quota system. It needs to be this holistic review where you look at everyone individually and you consider all these factors. And in considering all those factors, race can only be one of the many factors that you consider. In your study, sort of taking from your legal to your education, what happens in the wake of the 78 decision to the enrollments basically at public universities, because we tried for, let's say from 65 or something to 78, we tried to, you said, correct a historic wrong. And then the court says, well, you can't do that, but if it's good for the university as a whole, diversity of viewpoints, et cetera, background experience. So what happens then to the, how does it mm -hmm. impact? Well, practice? it creates a shift in practice where everybody is now working to try to have their policies align with this requirement in Baki to have holistic policies. There's a period of time when there's some you know, confusion and uncertainty because it was a very divided opinion. You had a 414, what was the controlling opinion? Okay, it was Justice Powell. It means that the, the one makes the, it's kind of the controlling rationale, right? Because their vote makes a majority on one side or the other. So we have one justice, and we hope he read all the social science studies. Well, and at on the this time, topic. at the time, you didn't have a lot of social science related to the benefits of diversity. So you had to sort of assume this is how the country is operating, this is how it works, this would be fair, 16 is not fair. No, and in fact, idea. he points to the admissions policy that Harvard has in place as an exemplary of the type of holistic admissions that, that would meet and pass this constitutional test in his mind. So it's, it's ironic that we now have, you know, that practice being the one that's challenged. We could presume probably with absolute certainty that that's a university he was familiar with, since traditionally all of the Supreme Court justices attended either Harvard or Yale Law School, maybe Columbia one or so. But so he knew this is a good Stanford occasion. This is a good model. Correct. This works. Correct. So Correct. Ironically, you said so. In '78, Harvard decided this is okay. It's holistic. Yeah. Now it's 2018. Yeah. People are saying this is well, no then you have a period of uncertainty. You end up with an opinion from the Fifth Circuit that called Hopwood versus University of Texas that says, actually, no, we don't think there's a compelling interest in looking at race and admissions. It leads to the states that are governed by the Fifth Circuit to not be able to look at race. And then we have the next set of challenges that culminate in 2003 with Grutter v. Bollinger and Gratz v. Bollinger. And by that, by the time that those challenges get to the court, you have a much more robust body of evidence documenting all the benefits of racial and ethnic diversity for students in the classroom, for the institution overall, and for society overall. And then that's a strategy that becomes convincing to the one justice that's being targeted at the time with those cases, Justice O'Connor. And there you had two different cases, one against the University of Michigan's undergraduate and also the law school. It turns out that the undergraduate was using a kind of point system that they assigned to race in admissions, whereas the law school had this more holistic approach. The court rules that that point system does not meet narrow tailoring requirement, is too similar to what was happening in Baki, and that what the law school had was this more holistic consideration of race. After 
So we're throwing out the point system and now we're still left with this kind of holistic and race is one of several factors, but it cannot be given a specific weight. So it's still the same kind of holistic admissions process that institutions are using. By that time, we now have different policies that are coming in to play across the country with efforts to ban the consideration of race altogether with statewide referendums. So this is California Correct. has yes. a referendum already in, in California, the California Prop 209. You had Washington State with Proposal 2, Initiative 1 in Florida, and then a number of other states that come into play. Some of my studies, because you'd asked previously what happens to the enrollment after some of these policies, well, some of my studies have looked at what does happen to the representation of students of color after these bans on affirmative action. And studies show that when you can't use race as a factor, that the representation of students of color declines in statistically significant ways. These studies use methods that allow us to really isolate that result to the policy itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the impact is few enrollment for historically underrepresented uh, groups. There's going to be another question I'm going to ask later. How do you write an application essay and don't mention your racial or ethnic background in America? So in some ways, all the other parts of the application, you're supposed to submit this whole thing, this huge package, spend months as a senior in high school working on it. But the one thing that maybe has shaped who you are, you're not supposed to talk about it. So it's an interesting legal assumption to say we cannot look at this. But right. a student may say, but this is yes. who I am. Yes. How do, correct. So, yes. And yes. you always ask, who are you? What has shaped you? What experiences have you have shaped you? Have you overcome, et cetera? That's the whole right. bit of college right. admissions. And this legal, right. That, right. that's where this you have this real clash between these legal requirements and the actual social reality of what it means to ask a student not to do that. It doesn't place us into this context of neutrality, it actually ends up discriminating against students whose experiences have shaped them because you're preventing them from being able to present their full selves to an admissions officer. This is a really interesting point, I think, because I'm a white male. So in some ways, my identity is presumed to be so self-evident that I don't need to say anything and it's supposed to be clear. Right. right. And, and then other th- other markers, of course, for gender, ethnicity, et cetera, names, religion, all these other background things. But there's an assumption that everybody is neutral, but they're, they're forgetting that, of course, people in the historic majority and white Americans have, have been defined as neutral Correct. against people who are different. So this reality Correct. doesn't right. inform this as much, yeah. it seems. Right. Yeah. Quite interesting. So let's go to the Fisher case, and then we'll go to today, because there's one more case right after the, the yes, Bollinger case. Yes, so we cases. have those <laughs> Michigan, the Bollinger, Gratz and Gruder cases that end up preserving what Justice Powell says in Bakke, and it allows institutions to continue to use race in their admissions policies, but in that very limited and restricted way in which it can only serve the goal of the educational benefits of diversity, and it can only be one of many factors. And in that decision, Justice O'Connor actually goes further than what you had Justice Powell say related to the benefits of diversity, which were much more focused on the kind of critical thinking skills and free exchange of ideas grounded in that First Amendment principle, which was very important to Justice Powell as well. But Justice O'Connor goes further to say that this consideration of race also was important and needed to maintain the health of our democracy, right? Because when we're dealing with professions of law, for example, which are really the pathways to positions of power and influence in our society, that those pathways needed to remain visibly open to all, regardless of race or ethnicity, in our racially diverse democracy. So that's an important nuance of that decision. Is this the case where Justice O'Connor says, maybe in 25 years, we will no longer need this? So she said, right now in our society, I'm looking around, I'm saying we still need to open, to put out, as Lyndon Johnson said, the welcome mat and not the no trespassing sign. We need to still invite people into these professions because it isn't quite working yet, but it may at some point become... Correct. And and there's a debate in the legal community as to whether is that part of 
the holding in the decision, or is that what we would otherwise call dicta, meaning kind of a, an aside, flowery language for us to think about? It happens to coincide that the cases are being decided 25 years after Baki, so it's a nice kind of play in, in timing and words to have in the decision. But it's also very aspirational in light of the inequities that we have. Right, and then it's interesting because the what the law refers to as dicta, of course, that becomes, let's say, a meme or something in the culture that people pick these things up and people don't quite know. The opinions are so long and so well phrased and eloquent and full of jurisprudence, but they're also sentences that just stick. So a couple of things you quoted from people yes. say, this yes. just sticks. So yes. what Justice yes. Roberts says or what Senator O'Connor says, sort of this informs our thinking of these of these things because we can't all read all the cases Correct. and the rulings. I mean, Legal decisions don't interpret themselves, they don't enforce themselves, and it also depends on whose interest does particular language or an opinion serve, and then it becomes the kind of subsequent battle over, you might have had you know, advocacy and litigation and getting to the opinion, but it's after the opinion gets issued is how does it get interpreted and applied? And that's not self-evident. That also depends on who is there to help inform that understanding. And did you file an amicus brief? Were you a co-counsel yes, in an amicus so brief on the Fisher case? after the Gruder and Gratz cases, the next challenge comes up with Fisher. And, and that's where you had this unique circumstance of University of Texas at Austin had been governed by this decision that I mentioned earlier, Hopwood, where they could not look at at race as a factor in admissions. You have effort in the part of the state to try to maintain some kind of racial and ethnic diversity at the flagship institutions, and you have the passage of the top 10% plan in the state in the mid-1990s in efforts to have that be the way that we might maintain some racial and ethnic diversity. This is the plan that would provide automatic admissions to students who graduate at the top 10% of their high school. Of course, it's those students who know about it and who apply who might then be automatically admitted and they would then also need to decide to enroll. But because we have so much racial segregation in the state of Texas, it's one way that we might get to having some racial and ethnic diversity in the pipeline for students. So the university has this in place for a number of years, but then you had the Gruder and Gratz cases say, actually, Baki was right. Uh, we continue with this precedent. It overrules Hopwood, and it places UT Austin in a position to be able to, or all public institutions in the state of Texas. Texas to be able to think about, do they want to reintroduce race as a factor in a holistic way? University of Texas decides to do this. And then you have a concerted effort to challenge that practice with plaintiffs who are recruited by long-term opponents of affirmative action. And then they initiate the lawsuit. And then they initiate the lawsuit. So we have Abigail Fisher, this young woman, and she went to Louisiana State University after having been rejected from all the UT campuses. And she said it was not okay that she was rejected. She would have gotten in. And yeah. so she claims she would have gotten yeah. in, but someone else got the spot ahead of her on some wrong criteria, which involved race. That, right? That's the assumption here, that there was a spot that, I should have gotten correct. in. That's correct, yes. She doesn't spot. graduate from the top 10% of her high school, so she's not part of that automatic admissions. She's considered under this other set where everybody's reviewed holistically, and she argues that because race is being considered, that that's why she wasn't admitted. But there's so many other factors. So maybe she participated in a sports team or she did an extra curricular activity or community service or there's so many other factors. So she singled out race. Correct. As the one yes. That's and UT shows that even if she'd gotten a perfect score on the factor where race was considered as a factor of a factor of a factor, it still wouldn't have led to her admission because it was really that competitive of a cohort that was being admitted that year. Let me ask you a question in between. Why does the court take up a case like this then? Do you th this is a really hard question because the court decides to take cases when I guess the nine justices feel it's time to look at this issue and we need to well, reconsider so this. So there's a process called the petition for certiorari, 
petition for cert, which is you're asking the court to take it. And at that point, it's discretionary. They don't have to. At the lower courts, anything that gets appealed to a court of appeals, they kind of have to take it. But when you get to the Supreme Court, you have to show very good reasons for why they should take it. And at that point, there's a vote that happens, a decision to grant certiorari. And there you only need four votes in order for the case to then be agreed to, to hear the case. You need to show that it's a topic of national importance to the country or that you have a split in the circuits and that the court needs to be involved and intervene essentially so you don't have this two different interpretations of the same provision that should have the same interpretation. So at the time, you had four votes to be able to grant cert. And then after that, you have the full briefing of the case. And that's where, by the for that outcome, you do need a, a majority opinion for a decision. And the Fisher case plays out. So in the out Fisher in case, you had the four votes that granted cert, and then at that time, I was working with Gary Orfield, director of the Civil Rights Project at UCLA, whose work has involved bringing to bear social science on these legal questions and developments. And we came together through efforts organized by the Civil Rights Project and my role as counsel of record, meaning I'd been admitted to practice before the Supreme Court, so I could file a brief on behalf of what then turned out to be really the social science community uh, speaking on these questions. And then that case goes to the Supreme Court twice, actually. So they agreed to hear it the first time, 2012. They issue a decision in 2013 that sends it back to the lower court. Really a compromise decision. It was like a 6-1 vote that where nobody expected that outcome. They thought it would be really a very split decision. They send it back to the lower court to reassess, did the lower court really apply the strict scrutiny test appropriately? There was some language in the opinion that led the court to think that they hadn't. And so then they send it back. The lower court says, okay, let's look at this. They reach the same conclusion that it's constitutional, and then it gets appealed back. Then you have the four votes again to grant review. It gets decided. There's some drama that happens during this time. It gets argued at a time when Justice Scalia was still on the court. After that, there's the unfortunate passing of Justice Scalia, and then it's a question, you know, there was high anticipation what the court would decide. Justice Kennedy was really the one who, just like Justice Powell and Justice O'Connor in the past, was this really critical vote on this question. He had not, up to that point, upheld any classification on the basis of race any kind of educational policy that classified as having passed that strict scrutiny test. He actually had dissented in the Grutter case, saying that it had not been narrowly tailored. So it was really an uphill battle for individuals who were trying to defend race-conscious policies. The amicus brief you submitted in this case is arguing with many other social scientists, your colleagues, who say that actually the argument is that it enhances the educational outcome because the community is better if there's a more diverse set of students, et cetera, participating. Correct, That's yes. So right? it's a kind of two-pronged argument. One is it is necessary to achieve this goal that is compelling for institutions of higher education to further their educational mission, and that draws from the robust body of work that supports those outcomes as beneficial. And then the, the second part of the argument is that it was necessary to do in order to get there, right? That these other alternatives that under the law would be deemed race neutral, like top 10% plan, that that was not sufficient for the kinds of goals that the institution was trying to achieve. The brief that I was counsel of record in for there in Fisher, the first time we had 444 social scientists sign on. The second time we had 823, I believe, was really focused on both, but trying to expand more the argument around that second prong, that why it was necessary to still look at it. Okay. And what's Again, the outcome of the Fisher for case? The, the third time in a series of challenges against the policy, 
continue to uphold the policy as constitutional and say that what UT Austin was doing met the requirements of the strict scrutiny test, there was a compelling interest in the benefits of diversity, and that the efforts they engaged in were necessary to do that, that they did consider these alternatives in a sufficient way, but that they should continue to assess whether they need it moving forward. Right. So the opinion really brings back an emphasis and the importance to continue to have evidence to bolster the consideration of race and admissions. And is the argument now fallen by the wayside that this is a form of reparative justice to restore historical inequities and the impact of the long history of slavery and segregation? After Baki, that became a very difficult argument to maintain. So I spoke to Professor Randall Kennedy at Harvard, who has this book called For Affirmative Action, and he says this is the argument to make. He said it is reparative justice. He said the other one is a kind of win-win situation. It's good to have diversity for everybody. And he said that second argument, the one that you presented in the amicus brief, he finds it risky because it doesn't acknowledge the fact that some people will not get in, that they are as he says in this game, they're winners and there are some losers, like in every game. He said some people will not get in. And if you don't acknowledge that, mm. it's a hard argument. But he's, but mm. you're saying since Baki, this isn't really used no, as a legal No, it's a difficult, well, as a social scientist, wanting to argue for a compelling interest in addressing the ongoing consequences of racial discrimination and inequities is very important. But within the legal arena, it's very difficult to advance that. And so what you have is this more strategic alignment of social scientists with the legal framework, trying to push against it a little bit, but really working within it, because we know that the votes are not necessarily in the court to engage in a particular outcome. To get to the amicus brief that you've written recently with several of your colleagues, I know you're not the only author, of these, with these 531 other scholars. So you are actually taking on the case against Harvard quite explicitly and saying they're using studies that mismatch theory, et cetera, that have been all but debunked or not recognized as really solid and well-researched. And you're trying to correct the court or point the court in a direction and say, this is the reliable research on this. And they're using stereotypes and ideas about Asian Americans by, for example, saying all Asian Americans are pretty much one group, when there are huge differences among these groups. And so you're trying to get the court to look at what you consider the reliable yes, set of data, yes. right? And it's challenging because what these cases, really these new cases represent, you have the one against Harvard, but also against UNC Chapel Hill, a public institution, is a concerted effort to bring these challenges back to the Supreme Court at a time when you have a changed composition in the court and potentially the votes to further restrict the consideration of race in admissions and essentially enact this very colorblind reading and understanding of the Equal Protection Clause. In your research, what you can point to, you can say in Texas and in California, once you achieve that, you will actually severely diminish the number of underrepresented minorities in those universities, right? So you know you've already done the study. Yes, the we have the research clear. to show that when you can't consider race, it greatly exacerbates inequities because it leads to declines in students of color across educational sectors at selective undergraduate public institutions, across graduate fields of study, professional fields of law and medicine. And that's the body of evidence that we're bringing to bear for these questions. But those arguments were also made in the past cases, right, in the Fisher case. And the court, you know, already considered them. But this is a renewed effort in a very strategic way with new litigants at a new time when you might now have a different vote on the court. And the new litigant, can you say something about that deployment of Asian American students? And there's a, you know, fair disorganization, Bloom is using them as a group. Can you say something about that? Because that is a somewhat new phenomenon, and I think it's really captured the public imagination to say, wow, it's harder for Asian American students to get into mm -hmm. college. 
This is the story being told. It's maybe not the story and told in a lawsuit, because when you read the lawsuit, it doesn't quite have that story. But this is sort of it's pitting different racial yes, groups yes, against one another. Yes, yes, this isn't the first time. It's been used before with trying to really capitalize on this idea of the model minority myth, right? Individuals who might represent like perfect standardized test scores and really a movement to try to limit what we consider as meritorious or what we should be considered as kind of a definition of merit, very limited to this performance on standardized tests, right? What Lonnie Wunier would refer to as testocratic merit, right? That how well you perform, the resources you bring to bear on these tests is the sole measure of merit. And that's what this two-sided, you know, capitalizing on that model minority myth that represent this idea of very limited definition of merit and what should count in admissions decisions, while also showing, look, they've made it, why can't you? And that's that pitting of communities against one another. Let me ask you a question where you have to put on all your hats, the lawyer hat, the social science hat, and the hat is a regular civilian person. The recent, I guess, scandals around college admission, that there's some corruption, that people got in probably and they you know, used some methods they paid, right? So who knows what they got recruited. Why isn't the public attention on other categories of athletic admissions, of legacies, of people who have access. There's a category of children of faculty. So in some ways, there are lots of other categories to look at. Why is race the one filter that gets everybody yeah. incensed about this? And there isn't yeah. a huge movement against legacies mm-hmm. or against athletes, mm-hmm. or against right. musicians, I guess. Putting my lawyer hat, it's in some ways because that consideration of race triggers these litigation challenges under the Equal Protection Clause. And so that's what makes it to the courts. The social science hat, I suppose it's, you know, really reflects our debate as a society over race and how it plays out. The, going back to what you mentioned as to the kinds of things as a white male, you don't need to think about, we don't think about white males as having a race and having a particular set of privileges that need to be considered that is not this neutral default position. And so it becomes much harder to look at those practices. We have practices like the latest admission scandal that that represent really the kind of you know extreme of illegal practices that are criminal that we should lead us to then also question the other number of practices that are in place that as a society, we probably shouldn't be defining as legal or ethical, really, if we start from the operating assumption that people's life chances shouldn't be shaped by factors outside of their control, right? Like the color of their skin, where they're born, the parents that they have. If that's our operating definition of fairness, then there's plenty of other practices that we need to be questioning because they're very aligned because with they're wealthy, very aligned with well-resourced wealthy. families. Do you see anything good in these lawsuits against Harvard and UNC Chapel Hill and then these discussions about high schools in New York City and the scandals and with the, all the 50 other schools right now? Is there anything positive or is this just an attack on affirmative action? It's just this is a very clear, as you said, long term effort to get affirmative action off the books, which isn't even a form of policy. In some respects, the, all the discussion around race conscious admissions is this band-aid on a larger system that's more fundamentally flawed. So if there's any upside is that maybe it can help us not be so focused on this very limited way. And if that's taken away, then it's really a call for institutions of higher education to reassess, reimagine how they do admissions in ways that wouldn't be then detrimental to the very goals that they want to advance as institutions of higher education in a racially diverse democracy. Right, right. So the role of universities in, the, in a democracy, that they should feel they are active players in shaping the democracy. And yeah, not the debate world. over these policies take place over 
selective institutions of higher education, right? Institutions that provide, they're not the only ones, but they are important places that provide those positions to power and influence in our society. And that right a reason why Justice O'Connor thought that it was important to have race as a consideration in admissions. But in a racially and ethnically diverse democracy, individuals with racially and ethnically diverse experiences and backgrounds should be the ones that are creating policies that affect all of us. We know that that's not the case. The representation of individuals at those high positions of power and influence are predominantly white. As long as that's the case, we're going to have a system of racial hierarchy. And if institutions can serve to disrupt that system, um, they really need to be reconsidering what they think it should be valued in admissions because that what's valued in admissions is representative of what we think we value, right? And if we value democratic participation, the ability for individuals to collaborate, to innovate, the here I go to the argument that Lani Guineer makes about the democratic merit. How do we capture factors in admissions that lead us to the kinds of goals that institutions should have within a democracy that reward the very factors that we want to encourage in our citizenship? It's not what we have in place with a focus on standardized admissions. Liana, I can just say I, I love this statement and I really envy your capacity to have your legal training and your social science training and your common sense will inform all this. Because what you just said, that this is admissions is a way to see what we value as a society, turns the whole thing on its head. It's not about getting into the elite schools, but it's what do we really value in a pluralistic democracy yes. in individuals. It's really yes. great. I want to thank you so much for this conversation. I've learned so much. I want to go back and I'm going to read all of your briefs and your your many publications. And the one thing I want to point out, you have a Spencer grant right now and you're working on free speech yes, and inclusion I am. on campus. I'm looking forward to getting through all the episodes that you have on free speech because they really touch on this new area of work that I'm in. That's really an extension of this work. I feel, too, it crosses exactly, and I have tried to get a really wide range of voices. And with all due respect to all of your distinguished colleagues, I have some of the finest constitutional scholars in the country and education scholars. The students' perspective, I think, is so critically important in here. So I've been able to speak with students who have really taught me an enormous amount about what this debate is. And there's a generational shift here, and there's a when it falls along certain lines, demographically, it's quite yes. interesting. Yes, I'm seeing the same in my data collection and what I learned from the students versus administrators or the faculty. Well, I, I'd be happy to have you back on the show when you're done with <laughs> your Spencer you. study. That. <laughs> thank you so thank much you for so making much. the time today. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate it. Thank you so it. much. Bye-bye. Really Great. Okay, thanks so much. Okay, bye-bye.